What is the ideal clearance between the bearings and bearing schools of turbo machine rotors? With this million R dollar question, today's video begins and I promise by the end of this video, I will give you the answer. Bearing clearance. Have you ever had to answer someone about this? Do you already have your hunter opinion? What's your answer? I'm already saying that this topic causes some discussion, but first of all, I want to know what criteria do you use? Leave it below in the comments. Hello, I'm Ronaldo Peaks. This is TurboVup with the new steam turbine. Welcome. First of all, I may seem boring. But I believe I have to try to warn you about being careful with information that is not official from the manufacturer of your equipment. That's why I always make it clear that you should first consult all the information on your equipment, including clearances and the manufacturer's manual. The only official place, only the supplier can give the correct answer. And also only he is accountable and responsible for the information he provides. So always consult, always keep records of conversations, technical information and operational recommendations for your turbine if they are not all included in the manual. Also remember that in this video, I will not talk about how to measure bearing clearance. This is a subject for another video. Today I will focus on talking about how to calculate the reference clearance for bearings. A good thing, now with this disclaimer done and for those who do not have a manual or easy contact with the manufacturer, and responding to many who ask me about bearing clearances as a reference. Ideal clearance, acceptable clearance. I'll try to help by talking a little about this in a more general way. Be careful, be prudent. I'm not recommending that you use such parameters here, okay? It's just a reference. Bearing clearance, as I always heard, especially in college, for those who were in the exact field. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We should always respond with the classic answer it depends. My wife is going to go crazy over this, so let's go. The ideal clearance of a turbine bearing largely depends on several factors. It is likely that you have already used or heard of some basic rule, probably related to the shaft diameter one thousandth of an inch plus one per inch of shaft diameter, inch plus one per inch of shaft diameter, per inch times the diameter of the shaft in inches times of room per inch divided by times. The shaft diameter for nominal clearance is twice this clearance found for backlash. But if you look at all these references for calculating clearance, they will give, at least, maximum clearance. Very close result, and in this case, our only certainty is that they cannot all be correct but perhaps they can even be used as a reference. But is there one that applies better? If so, what would it be? First of all, the first care when talking about clearances should be with the magnitudes. Make sure you are using the same units of measurement as the example. Use the gap multiplier factor in millimeters, with dimensions and millimeters or inch by inch, converting whenever necessary. It is very common to find information about clearances mentioning units of inches. Although many of us are more used to speaking in millimeters. So you should work with all standardized units. That is, millimeter one inch. Another thing to be careful about is that there is no standard for what type of clearance. Some places will mention radial clearance, while others will mention diametrical clearance at the end. It doesn't matter, as long as you adopt the same standard for your calculation and leave it highlighted. I recommend always working and talking about diametrical clearance and millimeters, in addition to being easier to check. Direct physical measurement of the bearing shaft is much more practical. Another reason to use diametrical clearance is in a turbine. It rarely has the same radial clearance in the zero and degree positions, especially, more commonly in the mines that we find most there. In the case of horizontal turbines, and to understand why there are so many applicable rules, let's look at some important data on the relationship between power, torque and speed. The greater the torque of a turbine rotor or shaft, in other words, the lower the speed with greater power, the greater the diameter of the bearing neck on the shaft, and the heavier the rotor, the larger the more robust bearing must be. Furthermore, the higher the rotor rotation, the smaller the diameter of the shaft bearing body must be. The larger the bearing, the greater the clearance required for lubrication. So, in order of importance, the main factors that influence the design and consequently, the turbine bearing clearance, will be the weight supported by the owner of the rotor, the peripheral speed of the rotor bearing neck, the viscosity of the lubricant, the operating temperature. Too heavy a rotor can damage the patent or babbit metal which is very soft. On that note, I'm doing a video series specifically on patent metal grip. I'll leave the card link here in the description, when you're ready. Head over there to take a look. It is for this reason that the cross-sectional area of the bearing increases proportionally depending on the rotor load, requiring more robust bearings. The peripheral speed of the shaft increases, 
obviously with higher rotation or when in front of the shaft. It also increases when the peripheral speed limit limits the diameter of the shaft. When it is unfeasible to leave the bearing out too large, designers increase the bearing length. This increases the ratio of bearing length to diameter. For economic reasons, the preference for maintaining a one-to-one -one ratio. In other words, if the bearing is centimeters long, it will also be centimeters in diameter. There are some disadvantages to the proportionally longer and longer bearing. As this relationship increases in length, the bearing diameter becomes larger. It increases, there tends to be less oil flow leaving the bearing, making the bearing work at a slightly higher temperature. Another disadvantage is shaft deflection. Diagonal contact ends up with diagonal contact or contact with the ends of the bearing, and it's very long, longer turbines too but higher manufacturing cost. This is the case with more robust bearings. The higher cost, another disadvantage is that the greater drag of the shaft and the bearing is no less efficient. The longer and heavier the rotor, the more flexible the shaft, the more DR deflection should be expected. Therefore, rotor deflection may require increased clearances between the bearing and the bearing neck. The viscosity of the oil is a less important factor than the weight supported by the bearing, as well as the peripheral speed of the rotor. Although they are always considered another care that is sometimes neglected, almost no one cares much about them. I've even seen some cases where there are problems, such as very small bearing clearances. Maintenance personnel sometimes think that the turbine works better and doesn't have that much of a problem, but it can be as much or more of a problem than excessive clearance. Be careful with that too. For vertical turbines, the criteria may be a little different. To begin with, in vertical turbines, whether it is a rotor with a thinner and smaller bearing cord or a heavier rotor, it is unlikely to cause rotor deflection, as in a horizontal turbine. This way, we don't have to worry so much about the force resulting from shitting from above. As long as there is sufficient radial clearance for the oil film, the vertical turbine bearing practically does not need additional clearance. So, to finish and give you the answer you have been waiting for so far. What is the reference clearance for pump bearings as standard? I personally am used to using it when there is no information for quick verification in the field. When reading the manual nothing at hand, the factor of times the bearing neck diameter for minimum clearance of times the Macau pole diameter for clearance. But one observation is that the axis is very small. You will find using these calculations there. Very small clearance in any case. Always adopt a minimum clearance of at least one-tenth of a millimeter. Again, just for reference. Then he'll come out and say that I said that's how you calculate Macau's day off. Beauty. So, did you like it? What do you think? What is your recommendation? and experience. Leave it here in the comments. Thank you for your patience, for your audience, for sharing this video. A hug and see you in the next video.